This is it. This is it. In fact, the title of uh, my PowerPoint this morning when I was uh, finishing it up is done. <laughs> done. Uh, it actually fits with the passage, of course, but uh, nonetheless. Uh, if you're interested in catching up, of course, you can find this uh, uh, coming through the church office. Uh, the Sunday school section uh, or the video link is there, as well as all of our Truth and Twos. So you can go to both websites, Cominius Institute. You can also go uh, to markeckel.com and find those kinds of things there. But uh, notice especially the, uh, uh, the weekly newsletter. I think that's what we're calling it in church. Is that right? Is it newsletter? Is that good enough? Okay. Uh, so you can hit links there and find uh, catch up if you've missed anything. Uh, somebody, uh, in fact, I think it was David who asked me if I had uh, an extra copy of one of the lessons. I'm still digging out of emails. I'll get, I'll get that. If there's anybody that needs any of these pages, feel free to holler at me uh, for one reason or another. Well, let's begin with prayer. Thanks, Lord, for the opportunity to have read and to st have studied this book. We are grateful for this uh, wonderful preacher, uh, King Solomon who has given us this, these wise words to consider, not only for us in the church, but for those outside, and help us, Lord, to be good communicators of that message, because it's in Jesus' name, and for His sake, we pray and give, that, give it to them. Amen. So, uh, the first time I met R.C. Sproul is a very interesting uh, story. It was back in 1991. And uh, during those days, I was uh, especially enamored with one of his books called The Holiness of God. And I was telling everybody about it. It was one of those books that really kind of transformed or helped to transform my own teaching uh, because he's such a great teacher. Uh, he's uh, gone from us now, 2017, as I recall. Uh, but what a great teacher and a, what a great writer, too, uh, telling great stories. If you've never read The Holiness of God, you're in for a treat. Uh, it's one of those things you can page through rather quickly and then go back and dig the depths of, of what he has to say. So I was with Robin in this seminar. Uh, we had gone to hear him uh, speak, and uh, I had a copy of The Holiness of God with me, and I wanted him to sign it. And she, she kept pushing me toward the table. She said, go ahead, go ahead, it's okay. Well, I got to the table. That's all I remember. I think he said something to me. I don't remember what he said to me. I certainly didn't remember anything I said to him, because I don't know that I really did. When I came back from the table, her first comment to me is, you're white as a sheet. <laughs> I was deathly afraid of meeting somebody who I had such esteem for. And then years later, I remember his uh, famous line, uh, line when asked the question about who should your heroes be. He said famously, wait until they're dead and then pick a hero. <laughs> for reasons that you, know, you can ponder and, and consider. Uh, he, to me, was one of the great uh, theologians because he could actually teach. There are a lot of great theologians who can't teach. I've got to tell you that straight up. And they uh, have a real hard time writing uh, sometimes. They can write really depthy things, but to be able to communicate to people like you and me, uh, they struggle sometimes, but not R.C. He was brilliant. I think I've got most of his books. If you've never ha heard him or you've never had an opportunity to read him, I highly recommend him. And I emphasize uh, this point about him because, to me, he really captures the essence of what Ecclesiastes is all about. Now, remember, uh, this emphasis in Ecclesiastes from uh, King Solomon was all about simply getting this message across that all of life is a gift of God. And you'll notice that every single week in the handouts, we have given these uh, five statements all the way through. So uh, there are repeated themes throughout the book. For all people, all places, times, culture, everybody, everywhere, nobody has been left out. Everybody has been included uh, in these themes. The second comment is life is a gift from God. That's the essence of this book. The search for compl uh, completion is incomplete without God. That's number three. Every activity in life is fulfilling when God does the filling. He's the one who gives all life meaning. And then number five, understand the Bible to understand yourself and your culture. So this is the simplicity of this book. 
and the simplicity of a teacher like uh, R.C., who was also a great ph uh, philosopher as well as theologian, could go really deep into uh, matters, but could explain it so simply uh, with great stories and uh, great language. So, uh, once again, just to give you a snapshot of where we've been, this is the famous uh, diagram. You have two sh uh, options in this book. You can either believe that there is uh, all of life is under the sun, what you see is what you get. You believe in your five senses, that's it. Uh, you're a naturalist, materialist, evolutionist, that's your option, you have that choice. The only other option then is to believe that there is someone outside of this world to whom you must give an account. And this person then has established all of life the way it is and operates, and then you are accountable to him. So those are your two options and the two simple diagrams here to get that point across, which is what, where we have been uh, throughout this book. Remember the message that all of life is a gift of God. It's like a refrain from a hymn that runs straight through this book. Every single line of this book is pointing to these, uh, this chorus line that all of life is God's gift. So, when everything is said and done, uh, this, the title of this uh, slide here is Game Over, uh, if you're at all interested in uh, gaming ideas, uh, video games, that kind of thing is, is the idea behind this. What we want to emphasize here is what does the book say at, at its completion? Uh, what is it at the end of the day that Solomon wants to leave us with? And so we want to read these uh, last verses in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, uh, beginning with verse 8. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these, of making of many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So there is the, the end of the matter and what he wants us to leave with. So as I've suggested at the top of your page, uh, this is it, this is all she wrote. The fat lady sung, it's all over, but the shout and the preacher has finished his sermon. He's finished, and unless we've listened, so are we. And his point, of course, is that not only are we finishing the book, but if you haven't heard me, and you haven't made the right choice, then you're in for a world of hurt. And those are your choices, and these are the issues uh, as it uh, relates to our concern for this. It reminds me that I actually should have uh, made a slide of this uh, because I like to introduce people to great literature. Uh, my favorite American novel uh, is East of Eden. So uh, when I think about that particular book and the essence of it, and the point of that book comes down to the end where he emphasizes that uh, John Steinbeck emphasizes the word Hebrew word timshel, which is the word for choice. You have to make a choice. And I find that resonant within the idea here at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, that you have a choice. You have to choose. There is this way or that way. There's no third way. There's no third rail in any of this. So. Human life as vanity, uh, one of the things that's important to recognize is that chapter 12 and verse 8, vanity is, of vanities, all is vanity, is exactly the same as chapter 1 and verse 2. Exact repetition. We call this in literature an inclusio or an enveloping effect. It's kind of like having brackets. But before we get to that, we want to emphasize this idea of Samuel Beckett's play. This is a fascinating idea behind the word vanity. Now, Samuel Beckett, not a believer, uh, was a great playwright, but he actually produced a play that was 35 seconds long. And I've described it here. The curtain opens on a pile of rubbish on the stage, a single light shining on it. The light dims, then brightens before going out. The soundtrack is a human cry, an inhaled breath, an exhaled breath, and a final cry. That's your life, as far as Samuel Beckett is concerned. You're here and gone. And of course, Scripture speaks to this issue as well. It says uh, throughout Proverbs, Psalms, James, your life is but a vapor. You last for a little while, and then you vanish. 
But our view of life is very different having a God-centered view than one that is meaningless, which is obviously what Samuel Beckett was after. There is little light in your life. Perhaps you shine for a moment and then you go out and the only thing that you hear is crying and breathing and then you're done. So of course, the psalmist emphasizes this in Psalm 39, that this is the way of life if indeed you do not have a God-centered point of view. Here we come to the brackets. We've reviewed all of the options. He's, this is what he's emphasizing to us here in these last few verses. This inclusio or brackets with uh, 12, 8, and 1, 2, everything is vanity. One of the things that uh, is true about my life at the moment is that I'm grading papers. And uh, for this is true for any teacher, for any professor. So right now I have 50 students in undergrad, I have 10 in PhD, and so uh, there are probably two major papers coming in from each one of those, so you can do the math on that. I'm reading about 120 papers here at the end of the semester. One of the things that I emphasize, especially to my writing students, but even to my PhD students is, would you please make your conclusion connect to your introduction? Make sure that there's a seamlessness to the whole flow of your thought here, so that we can see an interconnectivity between these ideas and writing. This is a crucial component to speaking as well as to writing, by the way, that you actually end the way that you begin. Uh, the word pedagogy is a big old word, simply means uh, how we teach children. There's also a word called andragogy, which is how we teach adults. It's, they're two totally different ways that we do this. And by the way, this is actually happening right now. I'm teaching you very differently than I would if I was in a high school class or in a college class. But we'll leave that aside for the moment, just to emphasize this point that one of the things that we see throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, highlighted yet again here, is this idea of, okay, here's your choice. You, have, you can go this direction or you can go this direction, but you can't go both at the same time. And I'm going to put them side by side for you to help you to see it and understand it for yourself. So I think that this is the most powerful teaching method available to us. When you put things side by side next to each other, and you let students come to their own conclusions. Now, their conclusions may be different than yours, but that's the point. They have to make a choice. You see, the last thing that I've ever wanted to do as a teacher is to jam and cram information and ideas into my students' brains. My view and my philosophy of life, about, specifically about education, is ownership. I want you to own what you believe, so I want you to dig it out. I want you to go through the process with me. I'll show you the tools and teach you how to use them. But the emphasis on compare and contrast, you've got this view of life, life is a gift of God, or you believe that uh, life is only what you see under the sun. That's the bracketing that's going on here. He begins and concludes the same way. And then he says in verse 9, there's one more thing. He's not finished yet. He's said all of this. He's gone through all of these great ideas. The last one, you remember last week, we talked about the difference between youth and age, for instance. But in verses 9 to 14, he begins with this idea of furthermore. He says, I want to say one more thing to you. That's the reason for the addition sign over here. One more idea here. In addition to everything else, I want to say one more thing. And here's the thing that he wants to say. He has left no stone unturned. That's the essence of what it says in verses 9 and 10 that I just read. So the idea of being wise in Hebrew was that Solomon was in the vocation of, as a wisdom writer. He was one of the people who, in the ancient world, were, uh, was a sage. They would consider, we might talk of them as sages today. But they were wise people who would write these Proverbs. And if you recall, uh, Proverbs was uh, one of those wise uh, statements. In fact, it says in 1 Kings 4.32 that Solomon wrote over 3,000 of them. So this is quite a phenomenon. He's a man who could actually tell us about wisdom and what it meant. He taught it, many Proverbs with great care. We can find that throughout Scripture. And by the way, all of what is on the slide is also in your notes. I say that every week, but you don't have to write anything down. But what I do want to emphasize today is that you guys get a twofer today. So I gave you two pages, not one today. So we're going to talk uh, briefly here about this second handout, and I wanted to give it to you because this is really one of the crucial concerns of Solomon at the end of his book, is the fear of God. So you'll notice 
There's a second page here, uh, back in front, for you. Uh, it says at the top, Fear and Deuteronomy in the First Testament. You'll notice I did this uh, some years ago. At the bottom of the page, you can see that. But what I wanted to do here in this uh, page is to give you an overview of what does the fear of the Lord mean. I think we uh, simplistically uh, just kind of ascribe certain things to it because we think of these things in our American viewpoints. But I want you to notice that this is terrorizing when you think about the fear of the, God, the, fear of the Lord. So I'm just going to run down these eight ideas here. It has the idea of fleeing. It's also the motivation for right living. It's woven with obedience, number three. Moses is said to have performed terrible deeds, an emphasis on fear here, which includes signs and wonders, and Yahweh's terrifying name. Fascinating statement there. For, uh, number five, Israel is commanded not to have a broken spirit or become demoralized as they later would before Goliath. So there's a difference between uh, knowing what to fear and who to fear. In fact, I would say that's probably my definition for courage is knowing who or what to fear. Uh, number six is quivering or trembling in response to God's judgment. That's a really important idea here. We'll talk about just a second in Acts. And then concrete panic and dread resulting in quaking by sinners before Yahweh. So all the way through Scripture, these things are idea, uh, emphasized. And then number eight, ultimately intimidation is the result when one is confronted by superior numbers. And in this case, the idea is registering horror. So, you know, you know me, I talk about horror movies a lot, or the emphasis of horror literature, and there's a reason for that, because it runs straight through Scripture, the emphasis of fear and horror. So this is not some, uh, you know, we have awe and respect, though that's folded into this. No, we're talking about a terror. Now, I want to emphasize this, especially as I, it relates to Acts chapter 5. So you remember the story about Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira are doing what it says in Acts 4, 32 to 37. That is, they're taking some of their money and they're going to give it to people, and they want that money to be uh, useful to people that don't have as much as they, except that Ananias and Sapphira lie about the process and about how much they've given. When confronted in Acts chapter 5, in verses 6 and 11, go check this out, verses 6 and 11, it said, <laughs> That fear fell upon the church in verse 6 when this happened because it was in the church. And then in verse 11, what's it say? And fear fell upon all who heard it, meaning everybody, believers and unbelievers, both. So I want to emphasize this idea about the fear of the Lord. We'll, I'll hit on this uh, in just a few minutes again. But I wanted to hit this really rather hard today because I think that sometimes we have this tendency to think the fear of the Lord is simply, you know, I'm respecting him. No. There is no way when you read the book of Revelation and you see John falling down as if he were dead in front of an angel, not the Lord himself, but in front of an angel. If this is happening with angelic beings, how much more should we consider this as it relates to the God who we worship? So, when we talk about the origin of knowledge, we're talking about the origin being uh, specifically uh, found in the fear of God. This is where it begins. So, I believe that it's a sin to bore people with the Bible. So you can take that for what it's worth. There's a story to go along with this. But what does Solomon say? He sought to find the exact words. That is, he spent a lot of time trying to figure out what exact words should he be using. And you'll notice here, these are words of delight, and the Hebrew emphasizes here communicating in just the right way. I don't know how, how often we think about word choice, but word choice is huge. Think about an email that you have sent, which you wish you hadn't have sent. <laughs> Consider that carefully it, as an example of this. Upright words, sincere effort he put into this. And then words of truth, there's an objective quality to this. This isn't just up to the emotive response of some individual on the fly. So all of these words here are very powerful and important. Uh, I remember when I was, uh, we were moving from uh, Bismarck, where we taught Bismarck, North Dakota, to Adrian, Michigan. And I remember this like, like it was yesterday. One of the questions that was asked me by some of the board members 
uh, was how do you make the Bible exciting? And, you know, my, my first response was, you know, it's exciting all by itself. It doesn't need me. Uh, that wasn't what they wanted to hear, however, because they had just had a so-called Bible teacher who put students to sleep in class and uh, to their way of thinking at least uh, made the topic or the subject boring. Uh, so my point is never to bore people with scripture. My point is always to, to highlight the things that need to be exciting, but I want to be clear and say the Bible doesn't need me at all. Neither does the Spirit of God, but as we've heard this morning, if you haven't heard the message yet, you'll hear this, that the power of the Scripture and the Spirit doesn't necessarily need us. So, how do we work with words? Caring for the content. I don't know if, uh, well, uh, let me tell, you t tell it to you this way. When I was teaching at Moody, um, I taught a course called uh, Studying and Teaching the Bible. And so students had to go through a passage in a certain book, book changed every semester uh, that I taught the course, and they had to come up with their own teaching that came out of whatever passage that might have been. And at the end of the semester, so they did this whole process of what those of us who teach scripture usually go through. Uh, and they'd gone through the whole process, and then I asked them at the end to write a reflective piece on how do they now view their pastors in the pulpit. And every single semester I asked that question, they said, I have new appreciation for what happens every single Sunday. Now, I've said this before, but I'm going to say this again. You stop to consider what happens every single Sunday at our church, churches worldwide. Every single Sunday, a preacher is supposed to get up and say something brand new, or in a way that makes something that is so supposedly old new again. This is a total act of art. Stop to consider this. You know, you go down to the Indianapolis Art Museum, and you see stuff hung, hanging on the walls for months and years they have exhibits. They've been there for years. These guys have to do this every week, a new piece of art every week. All right, I just want to make, the, make sure everybody gets, gets that out there and <laughs> give a wave to Dave back there and, and thank you once again for all of the work. Uh, the hours that are put in to the study of Scripture are huge. And so when he's talking about this in Ecclesiastes, look at these words he's using. He's weighing these things. That's the word that's used. Uh, probably it means em an emphasis on listening or the evaluation. So he's going through this process of figuring out words to use, and he's weighing things against each other, trying to figure out what's the best way to say it. He's studying. The word there emphasizes caution. He doesn't just do this flimsily. Uh, he does it with great care. And then the word arranging means thorough. So this isn't just a, a flyover 30,000 foot view. No, we're digging deep into this thing. So when we t talk about teaching scripture, and specifically here in Ecclesiastes, this is the way of it. But at the same time that I would say to you that it's powerful and important to exegete the text, and when I say the word exegete, it simply means to allow the text to speak what it is saying. I also believe in exegeting the culture. So what does that mean? I believe that every time I teach, I bear the responsibility not only for the content, but the way that the content is communicated in a way that's pleasing. Words of delight, remember. So the concept of attracting people to the words so that they get the word. That's the idea behind this. So when I teach the Bible, I'm always thinking about the bridge between my culture and the scripture itself. So, just to give you an example of this, if I were preaching this sermon, if I were preaching this passage, totally different preaching than you're getting right now. I totally different way in which I would communicate these words. But in this setting, in this teaching format with adults, it comes across this way because I can't think of a better way to do this in a group of 50 to 70 adults every week. So I'm always thinking about not only what does the text say, but what does the culture say, and how do I connect the culture to the scriptures and the people living in that culture. So uh, this is unfortunately a little bit dark here, but come to my house, I'll show it to you. This is a picture uh, by our front door, and it was done for me my very first year in Adrian, uh, Michigan. 
uh, when I taught there by uh, my chaplain, student body chaplain's mom, who had a picture of this. It's really fascinating. It is a, an old man who is carrying this sign. This was taken in London. And the sign reads, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And so he's out basically doing street preaching. Well, that's a reminder to me consistently of not only what I believe, but when other people come to our home, they see this as well. Well, what is the point of this? I'm emphasizing that if Ecclesiastes is evangelistic in its outreach, what can we learn about how we communicate as Christians in a non-Christian culture? I think Solomon gives us some ideas, some pointers on this, and I'm going to highlight five of them here in just a moment. But this is not the way I preach today. This is not the way I preach today. It was good for this man in the time in which he spoke, in the place in which he spoke to the people for whom he spoke. But this is not what I do on the campus of IUPUI. So, my students once asked me when I was uh, going through the MA degree, getting another degree for English, uh, just finished that in December of 20, and when they would sit around and talk with me about classes, and they realized that I was taking classes at the same time, they would say to me, well, how do you do evangelism in your classes? Do you ever talk to anybody about Jesus? And I'm always reminded whenever I think about this of the famous John 3.16 sign behind the goal post whenever an extra point is being kicked, you know, in a football game. Uh, I don't do John 3.16 at IUPUI either. My answer to this question was, I write really good research papers. What is the attraction going to be to the people who already know that I'm a Christian? Everybody who's heard my name on the campus knows exactly who I am and what I believe. What is it that's going to attract them to anything I have to say? It's the work that I do in their classes. It's the respect that I give them in their disciplines, in their subject areas, to do a good job of what they think is valuable. That's how I do evangelism. So my approach is very similar in the five ideas here. Uh, in the way that I communicate the gospel even on the campus of IUPUI. So number one, my approach is broad and universal. I teach courses to college students. I'm not there to proselytize. My job is to communicate effectively about how to do whatever it is the class I'm teaching uh, I do. But I have tremendous opportunities to communicate in ways and with ideas that they've never heard before. And I could probably tell you at least a dozen times in any given semester when I will say to students, you're not going to hear this anyplace else on campus. So make sure that you listen to this. And so I'll do some diagram. And of course, the only thing missing is chapter and verse. It's all biblical. It's just doesn't have Bible verses after it. Number two, topics are human and common. We're looking for those ways in which we can connect to people in things and in uh, situations and circumstances and subjects that they deal with all the time, as we do too. Number three, words are specific and direct. Solomon chose very specific words when he was talking about the differences between the groups of individuals. That is the under the sun people and the life as a gift of God people. Observational choice is a better argument than obligational force. I am always setting choices before my students. I'm not forcing anybody into anything. But I'm laying it out there, compare and contrast. Here it is. Make a choice about this. And then five, uh, wise persuasion over personal condemnation. Uh, that kind of approach to people doesn't work. Uh, certainly not on an academic uh, campus. So I say all of that to say, this is the example I can give you from the work that I do. Your work may be very different. Your community and the place that you invest yourself in, your neighborhood may be very different from mine. But these are the kinds of things that come out of Ecclesiastes. And to Jesus' point, as he said throughout the Gospels, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the concepts that we find in Ecclesiastes, I think, uh, find their way all the way into the 21st century. So verses 11 and 12. These are words of the wise that have come to him and that he's giving to us. This is both the content and the manner of speech that is given in daily life and the message of the teaching itself. He's emphasizing that he is part of this wise group, but at the same time saying anybody who possesses wisdom can communicate this. 
And the idea, of course, comes through in verse 12 where he references my son. So any of us who are communicating truth to the next generation, however that might be, whether you're on social media, you're doing radio uh, broadcasts, uh, you're teaching, or you're just raising your own children, the idea of this is the same, and that is that we are inculcating wisdom from Scripture into the groups that we engage. He then uses these words, goads and nails. Goads were the prod uh, to stimulate the action, the kind of thing that you might see in a cattle pen. Uh, and then nails, of course, I think we probably know what a nail is. I've given an example of one here. But these words emphasized through Solomon's idea is that these words are painful. When we hear them, they're painful and they cause us discomfort. I don't know how many times I've heard students in my classes leave my class saying, you made my brain hurt today. And my general response is to smile and say, good. Because that's important. It's important that they take these things. They're hard, perhaps, to hear or to uh, actually practice. But that's going to open new doors for them and new thoughts about life and things. And then he uses this word shepherd. Now, in the ancient Near Eastern world, the word shepherd meant king. So the most famous example of this, of course, is Psalm 23.1. The Lord is my shepherd. He is my king. That whole chapter of Psalms is about kingship. So the idea is that there is one source for all of these words. That's where they're coming from, from one place. Now, on the back side of the main handout that I give you here is a section that I've just, we won't spend much time on this, just for the sake of time, but on the bottom section of this page, you'll notice that there is something that we couldn't get to in Ecclesiastes, which is chapter 5, uh, verses 1 to 7. And you can read through this, but it's the difference between taking God seriously and taking Him not seriously. And you'll notice here, taking God for granted, that we're flippant, we're thoughtless, we're hasty, we're blathering, uh, and we're evasive. And you can read some of the ways in which we actually do that or say those kinds of things. But taking God seriously means it takes time. It takes thought, which includes obedience. And then that trembling emphasis, the fear of God that we've already highlighted there uh, once again, and I've given some examples of what this might mean in literature. But I wanted to make sure to at least have highlighted that for you to say these are some things that we couldn't get to. But the idea of God light is not a good idea. There is no lightness about God, L-I-T-E, that is. So here's one of these statements. I don't know how many times I've heard this. Well, you know what the Bible says. Too much study is a weariness of the flesh. And I, I probably shake my head, too, when I start to respond to this. Uh, the idea of this, remember, I think it was last week I talked about the hermeneutics. The, the most basic three points about hermeneutics are, number one, context, number two, context, number three, context. The context of this statement is the full book of Ecclesiastes. He's saying, look, there's no sense doing any more work on this because I've already done all the work. Remember all the words he just talked about? I dug, I was thorough, I went through carefully constructing these words, all of that stuff. So any further work on this is just redundant. You don't need to do it. That's his whole point. It's worthless. So there's no sense in going any further. You're not going to find anything else new in this discussion between and under the sun or life is a gift to God. So please, whatever else you do, if we have a conversation, please do not repeat this verse to me, thinking that somehow this lets anybody off the hook for studying. Thank you very much. End of commercial break. All right. We have an answer. Verses 12 to 14, he emphasizes this. And there's a phrase here, and even the, the uh, ESV picks this up, and I want to take a disagreement here with the text, because the Hebrew simply says this, this is the whole of man. It doesn't say duty. And what uh, is concerning to me is that somehow we would be placed under some kind of external obligation instead of us assuming that this is what the end should be. So what does it mean? It means the whole concern of every person should be this. He's ending his book saying everybody should be concerned about this idea. Everybody. Nobody's left out of this discussion. My definition of worship is the total response of the total person to our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're pulling weeds in your garden, you're shoveling snow in the wintertime, you're doing whatever you're doing. 
changing diapers, washing dishes. It doesn't matter. The total response of the total person to our Lord Jesus is an effort of worship. To remember that, to recognize that the whole of the concern for all of our life is to remember that he's the one in charge. And then there's the last judgment. This is a, a portrait from Michelangelo. You can go check this out sometime. Michelangelo's uh, vision or view of the final judgment. But this is what Solomon emphasizes. In this life, fear God. We've highlighted this. We keep his commandments. We talked about Acts chapter 5 and the importance of seeing and understanding that. And then also in the next life. It's fascinating that the word judgment is used throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. And what we know about neurology, that is the study of the brain, is that the brain captures everything, even though we might not be able to remember it. Now, quite frankly, this is a little scary to all of us, I suspect, when we stop to consider that every secret thing, whether good or evil, will be understood. He Hebrews chapter 4 says, remember that famous line of the King James Version, that the word of God is powerful and sharp and uh, as a two-edged sword, piercing the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, understanding the thoughts and intents of the heart. And then, verse 13, everything will be uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I don't know if that sense chills up your spine, but it does mine. Uh, when I think about the issue of the judgment of God, and it says here in this, uh, earlier in this passage in chapter 11, verse 9, God will bring you into the judgment. It's a very specific judgment, which indicates that this is probably of the last judgment when God uh, brings all things to a culmination. Well, I'm going to practice what I preach here, and I'm going to emphasize the conclusion from the introduction. So one of the most famous statements from R.C., I suspect, was this idea of right now counts forever. And that was his line that he would quote over and over again. What we do in this life matters in the next life. And this is different, by the way, than Gladiator uh, with uh, Mr. Butler and all of the greatness, you know, what you do in this life reverberates through eternity. A whole different point of view there. This one actually understands that there is a judgment after this life and one that's an important one to us. So drawing all of this to a close, what's the reason for Ecclesiastes? This is a slide that I started with in the very first week. Solomon was just doing what he had been told. That is, he's standing before, he's standing between unbelievers and believers, and I called it the track rack. That's basically what I think Koheleth is or Ecclesiastes. And he's giving this to all the elites of his day who are coming to see him. 1 Kings chapter 10, all of these kings and queens, remember Queen of Sheba, she comes to see him, and the great pronouncement of belief that she has there, an amazing statement. The reason for Ecclesiastes. And so I have to ask us, what is our bridge for us now? How are we communicating this message of Ecclesiastes, the whole of the scriptures? How are we doing that today? And I've listed some questions here on the back side of this page. And you'll notice here at the top of the page on the back, I've said adopting and adapting an evangelistic approach. And then you see a big note there. How we say what we believe in the church is different than how we communicate in our culture. So just, was it two weeks ago? I was with a colleague and he was having a very difficult time understanding how as a Christian I operate uh, in the public sphere when I do not necessarily agree with what they teach and the university. And I said, it's a very big difference between how I communicate, let's say about, let's, let's just be real specific here. It's very different about how I communicate about transgenderism, about homosexuality, about Black Lives Matter, about any kind of um, emphasis on cultural uh, connections to uh, what anybody says. Uh, Abram Kindi is coming to IUPUI. Uh, his anti-racism theme, how I talk about any of those ideas in the church, totally different than how I deal with it in the, in the culture at large. And I said, look, my responsibility, Scripture teaches, is for the group of people that is called the church. And we communicate these things very specifically in the church. But when I'm in the culture, what does Scripture teach? It says, for those outside, you should be very careful about the words that you choose. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 11 and 12. Colossians 4, 5 and 6. 
Our responsibility is to have our, our speech seasoned with salt. We should be very careful about how we communicate with outsiders. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, this is fascinating, one of the uh, statements about what an elder is responsible for is to have a good reputation before outsiders. Isn't that fascinating? I've always thought that uh, pastoral resumes should include at least one be unbeliever as a reference so that the unbeliever can say, yeah, I don't believe anything they believe, but boy, do they live a life that is certainly exemplary. So those are the kinds of ways in which we distinguish between how we teach in the church and how we teach in the culture. And this is what I want to emphasize because I think it's really important. I think we blur this line, and I'm speaking specifically to us as Christians, we blur this line too much. So I've given three ideas here. Here's what to say, how to say it, and when to say it. And you can read them all, but I'm just going to hit the highlighted, underlined statements. So here's what to say. I just made this comment to another colleague at the university last week. I said, there are 8 billion people in the world that worship something or someone, and theology is always a center of every discussion or decision, unconscious or not. Why is it not emphasized at this university? I made that statement. Because I said, if you're, if you're going to really care about connecting to the culture and, and caring about the audience, which is all about what we do in the School of Liberal Arts, theology is missing him, baby. Come on, show me some theology. And let me come teach that. Let me, let me have a shot at that. And then here's how to say it. So I've underlined number one here, communicate on the level of the audience. And here's what I want to really zing home to us all. Consider your tone of voice and your word choice. Be careful about the things you say on social media. I just come right out and say it that way. Be careful because people are looking at that. They're going, oh, yeah, there they are again. Yeah. Now, be straight up, straightforward about the gospel, about what you believe. No holes barred. But the way you communicate about cultural issues, be very careful. And always remember that politics is not religion in the church. Politics is religion where I teach at IUPUI, but it is not in the church. And here's the third point. Here's when to say what you want to say. And the third point here is spend time with people. Ask questions, seek understanding, follow up on earlier discussions, and anticipate the difficulty that your friends may face. Every single person is dealing with something. And when you spend time with them, they will begin to open up to you. And they will say to you, you know, you're really different than I am, and, I, and we have to two totally different views of life. But i got to ask you, how do you deal with fill in the blank? And because you've lived a life before them that exemplifies the gospel, that will be the attraction, Titus 2.10. Attract people to the gospel of Jesus. So for us, we need to know what to say, but especially we need to know how and when to say it. Because sometimes it's probably best to keep your mouth shut. We all know that, but it's harder to practice when we're actually in public. So, we are done with this teaching for this semester. I'm grateful for your kind attention, and thank you ever so much for being here, and we will see you down the road. <laughs>